God morgon och välkommen till um, masterclass i AI. God morgon ja. God morgon. På en fin vårmorgon, frisk morgon. Fantastisk med sol ute. Ja, ja, ja. Kjell Einar Andersen fra Nutanix, det er deg. Det er meg. Jens Christian Bang fra Olrediaen, det er meg. Så vi skal kjøre sendingen, og så har vi med et par professorer som skal uh, ha noen innlegg. Og så har vi med oss Fredrik på chat. Chatten er litt, litt viktig, for det er på en måte dialogen, og siden vi har en streaming, så er det, det er viktig å bruke teknologien sånn at det ikke blir en platt TV-sending, men også ja. at vi kan være så pass interaktiv. Ja, litt da, aktivt. Ja. Kan du stille noen spørsmål? Stille spørsmål, gjerne stille spørsmål om AI. Um, Fredrik som sitter her, han jobber konstant med AI, så han greier sikkert å svare på litt tekniske spørsmål også. Vi uh, gjør i hvert fall så godt vi kan. Um, så så det, det er det. Vi skal gjennom... Uh, fire innlegg fra professorene våre i, fra USA, ja, ja. fra Northeastern University og fra Princeton University. Og Columbia University, de er professorer også. Ja, de er professorer på flere steder. Ja, de er, dette er folk som vet hva de snakker om, ja. så Dr. Art Langer og Dr. Norman Jacknis, ja. som skal ta oss gjennom en del rundt AI. Vi skal touche både litt om AI-utvikling, AI-muligheter, og litt om organisasjon, for det er en organisasjon skal du også få på plass for å få dette til å gå rundt. Ja, for det, det synes jeg vi skal bare snakke litt om før vi starter for det, og det kommer jo professoren også til å si, men hva, hva skjer hvis man som en uh, leder av en forretning, en virksomhet, ikke gjør noe med AI nå. Det er jo det som er, um, man vet jo ikke hva som skjer, men, men uh, man, man kan bli litt akterutselt. Ja, og det er jo det, det store spørsmålet som uh, godt og lenger kommer til å stille også. Ja. Uh, hva hvis du ikke gjør noe? Mm. Altså, hva, hva skjer med din bedrift? Vil du bli uh, akterutselt? Altså, ja. disruptive? For det, et, vi kan jo se også på vi har jo hatt noen disruptive teknologier som har troffet oss. Vi har jo vært i bransjen i noen år. Ja. Og vi husker jo når internett kom, hvordan det endret verden. Ja. Vi husker når smarttelefon kom, endret verden. Vi husker når cloud kom, endret måten vi jobbet på. Ja. Det er jo tre veldig disruptive ting. Kanskje er AI den neste disruptive tingen som vil treffe oss, og som gjør at vi må end, som bedrift må endre måten vi jobber på. Det kommer kanskje nye teknologier. Men det som jeg tror mangler hos mange ledere i dag, er dette med å forstå AI såpass godt at de kan begynne å tenke hvor kan jeg bruke AI i min business? Altså fordi du har en bransje, du har et fag som du jobber med, og så, og så må du begynne å, å trekke inn AI for å løse oppgaver. Ja gjerne bedre enn det du gjør i dag, ja. og på en mer effektiv måte, og som med å spare kost. Ja, og dette, med spare, dette kommer vi til å komme inn på, det med å spare kost, ja. eh, og det snakker Dr. Lenger og Dr. Nacknis, Nack, Jack, Jacknis om, det er hvordan du har ah, ja, en annen måte å organisere seg på, det er en annen måte å gi budsjetter på, for ja. det, i AI så må du prøve å feile. Du kan ikke ta en top-down approach og komme ned. Du må ta bottom-up og du må finne ut av ting. Og da må bedrifter starte med dataen sine. Det er der hele kluet ligger. Ja. Så det er utrolig spennende. Vi kommer jo til å snakke en del om S-kurven. Ja. Og S-kurven er jo den vi kjenner fra innovasjon. Innovasjon, altså, ja. Ja, ja. Adapter, ja. Så, og det er i hvert fall at de som ja. har studert på deg har fått, fått med seg det. Men, men det sier jo litt om uh, hvor i stadiet et produkt er ja. over tid. Ja. Ikke sant? Og alle produkter kommer til å dø eller forsvinne før eller siden. Ja. Ikke sant? Så i begynnelsen så er det ganske sånn bratt oppover, og så har du en topp, og ja. så går det ned i en lang ja. hale. Ja. Og, og når den halen slutter til slutt, så, så er det produktet ja. dødt. 
Og et typisk produkt som har vært der i hvert fall vår levetid, er jo Coca-Cola. Ja. Og de er jo der enda. De er jo der enda. Ja. Eh, men vi ser mer moderne produkter, teknologiprodukter, vi nok ha en mye kortere ja. eh, S-kurve da. Ja. Og nu de snakker jo om det her, og de sier at vi er jo helt i begynnelsen. Vi er, AI er jo helt i begynnelsen nederst på, på ja. stigen. Men, eh, og dette vil eh, Dr. Lenger snakke om, om det er tiden er annerledes enn før. Ja. Tiden på S-kurven. Den er, S-kurven er mye smalere, og det går mye fortere. Og for å ta ut de som skal in i den det merker og, og ta ut gevinst med bedre margin, ja de må være på. De må, de må vite det nå. Men, så det skal vi snakke om, men det som også er veldig viktig nå for bedrifter, så vi skal touche et par ganger, det er jo en EUs nye AI Act. Ja. Den kommer nå. Den blir vel ikke 100 prosent før, jeg tror det var 2026, men du må være en bruker den nå. Og konsekvensen med å gjøre feil her er jo opp til 7 prosent av omsetningen din i bot. På personvern eller GDPR så var det vel 4 prosent? Ja, og EU har jo den ekten har, har definert hva som er eh, uakseptabel risiko, ja. eh, hva som er begrenset risiko, og det er så forskjellig så de har nivådelt det. Ja. Og de er veldig strenge med hvordan du skal jobbe med AI. Og dette er den første i verden som har kjørt gjennom en sånn eh, regelsett. Og jeg tror vi i våre eh, videoer så vil vi se noen eksempler på hvordan AI blir brukt, mm. som eh, ikke vil være mulig å bruke i EU etter den nye regelsettet. Men det kan vi jo se litt på etter å ha sett videoen. Ja, det kan vi. Er vi da klare for å kjøre i gang eh, art? Kjøre i gang art, og eh, det store spørsmålet. Ja. ja. Jeg tror vi skal gjøre det. Veldig bra. Da sier vi vær så god til professor Art Langer. All right. Well, thank you, uh, EJ, for the great introduction. And uh, thank you, uh, Professor Jackness, for joining me today. Wow. I'm excited. I hope you are. Look what's going on with AI in the world. And, and we're going to give you some insights to the things that are happening now. And so many of the things that we're not sure are, are going to happen. But what we want to do first, let me at least frame this about the evolution of AI strategy as we're going forward by stepping back a minute and really talking and thinking about the people that run companies, the people that you report to, the executives, and what are they going through right now? Because if you can understand how they're thinking and what their needs are, that guides you in how you need to maximize your value proposition to these individuals. So I will start with a question, a question that you should be asking these individuals. What is that big question in the boardrooms? What is that big question on the executive meetings and shareholders and other people? Because that's where all of your roads lead. And that question is a very simple one that everybody's asking. How do we anticipate this stuff? Because it's unexpected threats that have been brought on by AI and generative AI, all the things that Norman was going to talk about today, that could devastate our business. I mean, and that's the first thing. It's not just how do we take advantage of this new cool stuff. It's what are the threats, all right? And there's three underpinnings of that. There's the cybersecurity issues. There's the strategic issues with all right, that are going on. And there's also the notion of how to put this stuff into place organizationally. We've seen a lot of people with great plans that really couldn't convert their cultures. So think about those three things. And the message I give you as we're framing this is how do you put yourself in a position to lead these issues? So what are those typical disruptive factors? Well, obviously, there's a new approach. Someone comes up with a new idea. Well, is that really anything new? It really isn't. People have been coming up with new ideas forever. The difference is a digital strategy that wasn't previously feasible. Let me give you an example. Uber, that's changed the world of travel, right, in many ways, took a smartphone, took a satellite, and took Google Maps and changed the world 
and didn't own any of that technology. Now, this is significant factor. I don't know if you've thought enough about this, but years and years ago, and for many of you who started in that business then, everybody was talking about IP. Everybody was talking about owning things. We are now in a shared economy. We want to be able to share our technologies, and it is the companies that understand how to deploy it transform their cultures, get non-IT people engaged. Wow, that's the most valuable player for me, all right? So AI disruption occurs when a new approach meets the right conditions. But we have one other thing that many of us in the technology world don't really like because we've never been brought up on this. In order to get the right solutions for the right conditions, there's a new thing that has entered into our lives that we hate, and that's risk, right? We've all been brought up on delivering on time on budget. Well, I don't know about that anymore because you now have to have a failure rate. You now have to be producing more ideas than those that will be successful. And we all know what that means. It means you're gonna have to spend more money and you're gonna have to have more ideas than those that will be successful. And you, you need to understand how to articulate that to your boards, to your CFOs, to your CEOs, and to others. And the companies that do that better will be successful. And always remember, and I'll come back to this at the end, always remember that those that can articulate it and have the technical background, which is what you have, are those that will be most successful. Now, let me add one other thing that's crucial to our conversation. You may have forgotten this, but I'm going to bring back that famous S-curve, that economic term, right? This is not my theory. The S-curve is the economic theory that states the life cycle of any product or service. Now, how does that reflect AI acceleration? Well, let me just go back and take a few minutes and remind you about the S-curve. It has a Y-axis and an X-axis. The Y-axis is the process itself. Let's cover that first. If you're down here on the S-curve, it means that you are beginning an idea. The market is uncertain. When markets are uncertain, they're risky. They're the areas of new ideas and innovations. And two things can happen, right? One of them, you fail fast because it's just not there. And that's your risk factor. But the other part is capture the market and don't worry as much about the investment dollars. I know that, that, that you're shrieking right now, but this is what you have to start communicating to the people around you, all right? Because if you know anything about venture and private equity, that's all they worry about, right? They worry about capturing the market and considering that the market is real. And what we know about the lower portion of the S-curve, it, it is somewhat uncertain on how things are gonna go. Now, if you're successful on the lower half, the lower third of the S-curve, you will capture market. And demand is higher than supply when it's successful, so prices are high, right? But the S-curve tells us, guaranteed in economics, that when you reach the middle of the S-curve, two things happen. One, you will get competition. If you have a good idea, you will get good competition. Second thing, because of that competition, there'll be more supply. And when there is more supply, prices start to come down. But the real significant part about the middle, if you've been successful on the bottom portion in entry, you will enjoy the profits at that point because you've captured the market. By the way, I'm giving you the story of Amazon, right? They lost money, they lost money. And then when they captured the market, they had what we called this accelerated growth, all right? Ultra accelerated growth. Now, the S-curve also has some bad news for us because when we get to the top of the S-curve, that's when supply is greater than demand and you're reaching commoditization, which means you are at the end of the competitive life cycle. So take, for example, IBM's PC division, 
which inevitably sold out to Lenovo, you can still make money, but they're on very limited margins. And ask yourself, do people really care what kind of a PC you have anymore? Yet if you went at the beginning of that S-curve, having an IBM or an Apple was critical. Got it? So the question becomes in your mind as you go through this is where am I on the S-curve? If you're on the lower portion, it's risk. If you're in the middle, enjoy yourself and your success. But start thinking about what happens when you get to the top. Because if you've ever been on a roller coaster, what happens when you get to the top of a roller coaster? You come down. But there's an interesting thing the way you come down. You come down a lot faster than the time that it took you to come up. And therein is the story of Nokia that lost 75% of its market share in six months because it didn't have a smartphone. So if you don't catch it right, all right, and you don't change when you've reached commoditization, like Nokia, with a flip phone, you could fail extremely quickly. And that's what has happened to companies like Toys R Us, GE to some extent. These, these are the causes, but this is the way you've got to talk to the non-technology people. Okay, now let's go to a more important and relevant piece, the X curve, the X axis, that is time. So if I were to tell you here that the X axis to the end here is two years, what does that tell you? The life cycle of the competitive nature of this product or service will last two years. After that, you either replace it or you dramatically enhance it. Now, suppose I tell you hypothetically that this S-curve represents an S-curve of a product or service in the year 2000. And this S-curve represents that in 2010. And this is the S-curve today. Ladies and gentlemen, what is happening? The S-curve is shrinking on the X-axis. What does that tell you? That the metabolical, the metabolical rate of going out and accelerating the end of the cycle is accelerating. It is shrinking. It is the acceleration, right, of the end of these products and services. So when you produce something new, the ex expectation of it lasting is shrinking. So the metabolic rate of change is increasing. It is the better word I can use for you, the acceleration of obsolescence. That's why things continue to change. You have less time. The S-curve is going to be shrinking and you ought to have one for every product and service that you have. I hope this sinks in. Now, some people would look at that as an opportunity. What does this all mean? The world is changing at an accelerated rate. What does that mean to you? How will new waves of disruptive AI technologies affect the organization? And that's going to affect the way your services are delivered, managed, and measured. Repeat that 25 times tonight. How do I take advantage of these changes and obsolescences that are coming in areas of the way we deliver things, how do we manage them, and how do we measure them? And that includes the way you lead in organizations. Tack Art Langer. Ja. Det är um, blir lite han skrämt när uh, <laughs> man säger det på den måten. Ja. Hastigheten ja. Ja. Hastigheten för för du har en uh, produkt där det är er obsolet ja. Ja, vad som sker hvis du inte hänger med. Och det ser vi inte hänga med. Ja, det är er ju också att finna ut hur du ska utnyttja den här AI i din bedrift. Ja. Men det handlar inte bara om det. For i bunn og grund så må du begynne å se seg nemlig, altså sikkerhet. Ja. Eh, dataene, hvor er dataene dine? Hvordan håndterer du dataene dine? Og det er det vi i Nutanix jobber med, altså sikkerhet og data. Det er jo en av de tingene vi jobber i med våre hybride skyløsninger. Så veldig viktig eh, områder, for du, du må være på her eh, og vite hvor du har dataene dine for å gjøre riktig. Men med chat GPT... Ja, ah, nu kan vi lite data med tipper er hos Microsoft ett landsta då, sen är OpenAI er som delvis ägda av Microsoft. Ja, det är väl Azure. De har helt säkert inte Azure på 
i, i Norge? Nej, nej, altså hvor de ligger, det er ikke, jeg vet ikke heller, men de har jo bare gjort crowdsourcing, altså de har jo bare gått ut på og, og kan vi si, sugt internet for data, ja. tom for data. Uh, så det er jo en, en måte. Det går aldrig tomt. Det går aldrig tomt. <laughs> men en annen ting som er veldig viktig, som Dr. Atlanger sier, det er, non it personer alltså de som vi IT vi vi snackar om data vi snackar om AI och vi vi sätter upp och vi har cloud och vi har ting och tang. Ja. Detta är er ett språk som de högre upp i i ledelsen inte förstår. Nej. Så det är så ha ett språk och snacka med icke IT folk om AI alltså finna mått nu ska jobba på. Vi kommer tillbaka till det senare i i dag och det är er otroligt viktigt. Och så är er det timing och risk så han nämner. du må du må träffa på timingen och du må vara villig att ta risk risiko för att så få för att du vill pröva fejla. Det är er inte säkert att uh, ting uh, vill virka. Du får en idé, då ska du testa det ut uh, raskt. Funkar idén? Bra. Men funkar den inte så ja. Er det och det betyder ju att funding alltså budgeta för AI mm. må du också tänka annorlunda för det är er inte så att du har en idé och så gör du en funding till det projektet. Du må ha många små ting som pågår på samtidigt. Det er kallas man ryggrad till detta. Alltså särskilt nå som det är er lite mer nedgångs tider. Nej, det är problematisk för en del sällskap så Men har du nog valg? <laughs> har du det? Det är er liksom det, men men du må så lära dig själv då. Ja. Och vi ska ju vidare i, I att på se mer om möjligheterna för ja. du kan göra mycket utan i stora kostnaderna. Men du måste ha resurserna till att sätta in. Ja. Och det går ju att köpa alltså sånt som Nutanix levererar en chat GTP in eller en GTP in i en box ja. så du kan köpa en färdig stack och bara deploya det eh, för att så komma igång för det här är er helt klurigt du må du måste komma er för GTP så så sånt som ja, ja. som du har tränat upp language model och sånt är er färdig uppsett med allt in färdig så du kan starta upp utan att behöva så börja och göra så mycket färdig installerad lösning mm. men du måste börja smått och du måste ha många idéer och du måste vara kreativ Og du må være villig til å gjøre prosjekter selv om de ikke lykkes. Altså det, ideene må testes ut. Og jeg tror det er det viktigste når du ser på S-kurven til Dr. Lenger, så ser vi at tiden, ja. det er nå. Den er kort. Ja, det er nå. Og nå må vi sette i gang for oss å komme. Og vi, vi vet jo ikke når det kommer en disruptive teknologi som vil potentially disrupted in bedrift. Mm. Det vet inte vi. Nej, och vi snackar ju om ChatGPT hela tiden, men uh, Gemini från ja. Google har ju kommit och är uh, er bättre än ChatGPT på vissa områder. Uh, så så att uh, att det är er en konkurrens där ute är er, är er ju är er ju inte tvivel om. Och så Det finns mest ja. har ju uh, AIX ja. eller XI X ja. så så det, det ser ju mycket han har ju säkert tillgång till mycket av de som jobbar i ja. uh, OpenAI också ja. till man var del av Det finns uh, en skog enorm mängd er ja, bra ja. för i alla fall för oss som är er glada i teknologi då ja. så syns det att det är er spännande det kommer det många Ja. Och jag tror det det Norman Jacknis doktor Norman Jacknis ska snacka om. Ja. Det är er ju alla dessa trenderna och metoder som som pågår. för det är er så mycket där ute och han vill nog gå igenom dessa en del av dessa i första nog bara se på hur du organiserar. Och han reser så varför är AI blivit så hot nå? Ja. Det är er eh, nå, det är er morslov relativt till. Morslov med kraften vi har idag. Ja. Kraften, altså, det finns det finns AI ting du kan köra på en minnesstick på USB din. Ja. Tant, det är er kraften vi har i i computer idag är er helt enorm och eh, softwaren vi brukar har er blivit väldigt god. I tillägg så är er det massa open source så det är er ju detta vi ska gå lite in på. Og vi kan jo kanskje starte med en bare sånn eh, quantum computers. Ja. Yeah. Wow. Der. Der skjer det også mye. Der skjer det mye. Og når du begynner å ta AI og quantum computers, 
Ja. Når du kan når du snakker om datasett, vi kan kverne i den verden. Wow. Det er selvfølgelig mye spennende. Ja. Men så, er vi klare for... Uh, kanskje vi skal høre hva uh, Dr. Jack Nis uh, ja. sier. Det gleder jeg meg til å si vær så god uh, Dr. Uh, professor Jack Nis. Ok, thank you very much. I'm glad to be here. Thank you everybody for being here. Let me share my screen. Uh, EJ, everything is visible? Looks good. Ok, let's talk about artificial intelligence, where we are today. Um, this is our journey. Um, we're going to start with a quick review of, of AI trends, methods, and the many applications that there are, um, with uh, obviously a special emphasis on generative AI, both images and language. Uh, um, I I can assure you, I am convinced that you will find at least one of the things that I'm showing you to be of relevance to your organization or can be easily adopted. Um, and um, I hope you learn as well to think strategically about AI. It's not just sort of a question of technology at this point. Um, and then uh, we're going to go review a little bit about how you can lead the implementation of AI in your organization, uh, because, uh, you know, that's uh, that's important. You need to understand what the options are for technology, for management, um, even change management, which is a special issue for AI. Uh, it's a lot to absorb. Uh, we're going to break for questions in the middle before we go into our discussion of generative AI with language like ChatGPT. So uh, buckle up and get ready for the ride. Uh, first, why is AI hot now? Uh, the, the idea is actually going back decades. Uh, and uh, But what's different now are three things that are very important. One is Moore's Law. The computing power doubles every two years. You all know about this. Uh, but so much of the algorithms of artificial intelligence that we're familiar with these days depend on sheer computing power. Now that power is available to us at a reasonable price. That's why you're seeing a lot of this. Um, second is the software is getting faster and better. And this was uh, out of the OpenAI shop, uh, that's ChatGPT and Dali. Um, and they found that the efficiency of the software is actually improving even faster than Moore's Law. And then thirdly, the amount and source and variety of data is absolutely exploding. You know, traditionally you had relational data in a company, but now you also have all kinds of dark data that is amenable to machine learning techniques uh, and AI, such as emails, voicemails, PDFs, you name it, uh, everything, uh, in addition to the traditional kind of transactions you might have in a relational database. Uh, and you have an increasing percentage of our lives of consumer behavior that is online. Uh, it, you know, that wasn't the case in the past. Uh, you'd go to a store, they'd be able to collect some data. Uh, now, uh, if you buy on Amazon, they know everything. They even know the time it took you to make the decision. They, they knew uh, what else you looked at, all kinds of things, data that you didn't have before. Um, and this geographic data, you know, I'm sure you realize that at least your cell phone company knows every place you have been based on where you've taken your cell phone. So that adds to all the data we have. Um, and then we have data from wearables and the billions of other devices, this whole Internet of Things, uh, which is just dramatically expanding the amount of data. So we have a lot more data to work with, and artificial intelligence basically is built on having a, a need for all of that extra data. Um, this is a picture of a wearable, should have come up before, but that, believe it or not, that's a joint effort by Google and Levi's of the, the famous uh, jeans company uh, to create a jacket that is, has, basically it's a smart jacket that's collecting data uh, and also talking to the wearer. All right, with more data and more powerful computers and the better software, there's been an increased interest of senior executives in AI and ML. Right, the availability of so much of this data has really meant people are going to turn to you folks in the C-suite. They're going to turn to you folks, and they're going to say, okay, we have all this data. What have we learned? What can we learn from all this uh, now that we know so much about our markets, our customers, and a whole variety of other things? And the second is that they understand in the last couple of years, the cost of doing a lot of this has gone gotten down. Maybe five, ten years ago with some of the... Uh, early companies that were looking at AI and ML, they'd have some data scientists come in there and say, oh, we need a staff of 100 people and $50 million a year. And that was too much for most companies. 
Now that's no longer true. There's all kinds of activity you can um, and applications you can use AI for that do not cost that kind of money. And executives are telling each other this. And so they're going to come to you and ask, okay, when can you get started? What can you do for us? The other thing I'd mention is, you know, I, I mentioned these these three main trends, Moore's Law, the, the increased efficiency of the software and increased data. Just keep an eye out for how those might increase even more. I'll give you one simple example. Uh, if we get to the point in the next few years where we actually have um, commercially available practical quantum computing, uh, that will be an order of magnitude increase in computing power, right? So we'll be seeing all kinds of new artificial intelligence applications and algorithms just because that additional computing power will come. Now, there are various methods of AI. Uh, you know, one is uh, AI for prediction, in a sense. You might want to predict the number of errors in a set of transactions or mean time to failure, uh, those kinds of things. And this actually is typically still done with a very old technique called regression analysis. Um, and then you want to be able to predict what group someone is in or something might be. And this is a very common business situation. Who's going to default on a loan? Do I give them a loan or not? Do I give them a credit card or not? In healthcare, who might develop cancer based on the tests that I've done so far? Um, and, and frankly, many of these methods use uh, uh, something called decision trees, which you may be familiar with. But there have been all kinds of recent enhancements. Uh, that uh, use much more sophisticated capabilities of computers these days. But the basic idea is the same. Um, and, but by the way, just one thing you ought to realize, and you know, it's, it's very, very easy for people to talk about uh, what's the error rate for this stuff. In this business, there are really two kinds of errors you need to worry about. There's a false positive and there's a false negative, a little bit like the difference between finding an innocent defendant guilty or a guilty defendant innocent. Depending upon what your business is um, and what the meaning of those two terms means in your business, you have to worry about one or the other of those. You may have to worry about both of them, but typically one's more important than the other. Uh, the best example I can give you is there are a whole bunch of false positives coming from Amazon's recommendation engine. If you're a user, um, you know, you'll see they'll recommend things to you that you have no interest in. Um, they're, the, overall, the error rate is very high, maybe 70%. But the 30% that they reach, that's worth a lot of business to them. So, you know, it's not a big deal. Now, if you were trying to uh, predict who might have cancer, then you have a different set of issue, uh, issues as to how much error you're willing to uh, live with. Then there's AI to find patterns in data. Um, unlike prediction, uh, when you're searching for patterns, the human being, you, don't say anything about what the outcome was. You're not saying anything about a loan default. You're just telling the computer, here's a bunch of data. Can you find any patterns in it? Can this, can this help me in any way? Uh, typically, this is used to identify groups of people or things uh, with, with characteristics together. Marketing for years uh, has been interested in this um, to segment their customers into uh, parts of the marketplace it is also used to identify anomalies. Um, and in fact, the same logic applies to those recommendation engines, or at least at least what uh, goes into those recommendation engines is just based on looking at past patterns of things that people bought together or liked together. Very simple. It's not actually, it, it's not terribly complicated. It's just dependent on finding those patterns and data, but using a lot of big computers to do that because there's a lot of data. And then we come to AI deep learning. And there are very many varieties of this. I'm not going to go into all of this. And there are sort of front end services and back end and whatever. But the basic concept is that you have a series of input data and you have some outputs. Um, and in the middle, hidden, if you will, are a series of weights or layers. Um, now, the old fashioned kind, as you can see early uh, in decades ago, really had only one layer. Um, more recently, obviously, we have been using multiple layers. Um, this is really nothing. What's going on here is really not much more than just adjusting what the weights are on each of those input variables at each slice here, each layer, until you actually end up with something that's actually a very good predictor. It's bizarre that it works, but it does. Um, and you can see the little pictures on the bottom give you a little sense as to what's happening at each one of those stages. Now, I'm showing three layers here. 
Um, oftentimes you'll have 10 of these hidden layers, maybe more. That's why it's called deep learning because of all of the layers. Um, one thing you ought to realize, and that's a very good summary from the McKinsey folks, is that there is a trade-off here between how good the predictions are and how understandable they are. So neural networks usually, not always, but usually come up with the best predictions. In other words, they come up with the most accurate predictions of whatever it is you're interested in. Uh, some of the other techniques that I briefly mentioned, like random forest, not quite as good, but good. But still, the problem here is that the results are not understandable. I mean, the, you know, you've you've probably heard stories where a computer scientist or a data scientist are saying, I love the way this predicts, but I really have no clue as to how it's happening. It can be an issue. Um, on the other side, to the left here, uh, are those methods that are a little easier to understand, decision trees and traditional regression. The problem is they don't necessarily give you those same predictive um, you know, prediction power. And so there's a trade-off here. You need to understand that. Uh, then you have AI to explore an unknown environment. Um, this was uh, traditionally, uh, not traditionally, in the last few years, um, you know, people have called this reinforcement learning. If anybody's taken psychology, you remember where you sort of give the, the little lab rat uh, uh, some food for doing something, and that's how they learn. Well, this is exactly the approach uh, that uh, has been taken here. More recently, they've embedded deep learning into this, but the basic idea is the same. You take this, in this case, a robot, uh, and say, okay, explore your world. If you hit a wall, you know that's a bad thing. If you can keep on going, that's a good thing, and they learn. This is particularly uh, an interesting one from, I guess, um, 2022 uh, in, out of MIT, where they had this little robotic dog actually put it on its back, not where it's standing now. And within an hour, it could figure out how to walk around and navigate the room. So, and robots, following up on that last thing, all that is, frankly, is AI that can move around. Um, and there have been all kinds of versions of this. Uh, you've got robotic cars. You've got, um, um, even on the farm, uh, Agritech has been a really big uh, user of AI. Uh, you've now got tractors and other uh, equipment on the farm that's basically robot robotic. No people inside. Um, you have robots that serve various purposes. Uh, in the upper left here, I have a robot that's really, uh, it's using all the capabilities that you will see uh, capabilities of understanding what humans are trying to express, its ability to talk, all that sort of stuff. It becomes a companion, almost a pet, uh, it, in, especially for uh, people in countries with significant aging populations, and there's none, there are not enough young people to be able to help them. Um, you've got a social robot going on the other end. This is a social robot. Actually, it's not far from uh, where Dr. Langer and I uh, live. Uh, that's available in a dentist's office in order to calm down children about to face something in a dentist office. Um, and in the bottom, you've actually got a, a robot that's so skilled it can help lay high wires in very treacherous areas. Uh, robots even can write their own code. Um, you know, a, 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 Google put this out um, a few months ago. Um, so you know, now you're seeing sort of this next generation, if you will, of robots. But I prefer to look at the uses of this from a business perspective. So this is not a question of we're looking for patterns or predicting or whatever. Uh, this is really a question of three major categories of business applications that I think you should also think about. Uh, first is for internal problems. Um, you know, what do people complain about every day? Uh, what are the big big things that are costing money in your organization or wasting money? So you would use all the methods that I'm going to be talking about to figure out what those causes are and to do something about it. So this is within the company. Uh, then there are external opportunities, and I'm sure you've heard about some of these already. How can you increase sales from existing customers? That's a pretty straightforward one. You can identify that using a lot, uh, by using a lot of these tools that we're talking about. How can you get new customers? More important, how can you identify market segments where you should focus your, your efforts? Um, and a variety of these tools can be used that way. Um, and again, how can you reposition your organization? There's a very, I think, a very important relationship between artificial intelligence and strategic direction of an organization. Not just the kind of opportunities that are, uh, that are open up, but actually helping the organization figure out what its strategy ought to be. 
Then we get to something that I think is really most important. And I've been talking about this for several years. And it's finally sort of clear to a lot of people. That's third category is enhancing products and services with AI. It, it's helping make whatever you're offering to your customers be smarter, quicker, easier, all this kind of stuff. And obviously, generative AI is in this category. Uh, you know, in artificial intelligence in the machine, chat GPT, a new way to make a scene. It's gonna revolutionize the game. AI generated rhymes, no one's to blame. We now have an explosion of generative AI for, for images and language and being able to generate all kinds of stuff, like that little rap song. Um, you can see this in the uptake of this, and in, in the upper left is the generative AI, a chat GPT, has been faster than anything. It took five days for a million users compared to some of the other things that used to be uh, important, uh, as sort of flagships almost of how fast people adopt technology. Um, Business is picking this stuff up rather dramatically, and it's a part of every conversation on even you know, obviously for the big tech companies, that's basically all they're talking about. And I, I sort of love this interesting statistic. All of their earnings calls with Wall Street analysts, financial analysts about what their business is about, they've mentioned each of them on average uh, nearly 50 times they've mentioned AI in those calls. So this is very much top of mind. Um, and you can see there's a whole bunch of things people have been uh, budgeting for this. Um, and uh, this has been a very important part. So this is really an, an important question for a lot of CIOs and technology leaders and companies to think about because the money can be available and now you need to figure out how to spend it. So let's start with images because that, that gets to sort of deep learning and there's sort of really a lot of uh, the work that has been done in AI that you're seeing now has been focused in on images. I should, I should first before I do that, I should point out the reason why. Remember that slide I showed about the ability to predict versus the ability to understand? Well, if I'm trying to predict what customers might want to buy my product, I want to really understand a little bit more about customer dynamics. If try if I'm trying to use AI to distinguish cats from dogs, yeah, if I'm a graphic artist, I suppose I might be interested in the underlying characteristics. But in general, I'm mostly interested in separating out those two categories without much more. So a lot of the effort in deep learning has been on things like images where you don't really care to understand the underlying relationships. So you can do this kind of thing. You can identify the probabilities of various parts of a picture. And you can see, by the way, this is all probabilities. So remember, sometimes... You know, even if it's a probability of, of 0.9, you know, 90%, that means it's wrong 10% of the time. But in any event, you can, you know, assign, you know, see, take images, take parts of pictures, um, and it can identify the probability of being whatever it is, cat or dog or horse, as you can see here. Um, this is using something called the convolutional neural network, which is sort of a little bit of a variation on the theme of neural networks. Uh, you can not identify not just so sort of a category there, but you can identify multiple aspects. So in this picture is being analyzed and the probability of various things happening in it. Fairly high confidence that there's a social group and clothing, less so about a musical instrument, but possible. You can see you get this kind of result using AI. Um, in retail operations, uh, Google has introduced its shelf inventory. They're not the only ones. By the way, almost every example I show here, there's more than one company offering it. So, uh, you know, I'm just, I'm showing one example. I can't show them all. Uh, but, you know, you, you can actually now take a quick picture of a shelf and have a much better understanding as to what the inventory is like uh, than in the past when you actually had to send people out to collect all this data. And it was enormously expensive. Which gets me to another area. For example, it may be costly to check a variety of things. Now, all you need to do is have somebody send you a photo and you can do it. So this is from Airbnb. And Airbnb, uh, you know, wanted to be able to verify when a, when a host said there was a pool, that in fact there was a pool. So they actually use AI to analyze the pictures. Uh, you can see on the left, yeah, those look like pools. On the right, the AI was smart enough to say, yes, it's water, but those are not pools in this logic. In fact, it, even to the point that um, last year, uh, we had a bunch of folks who were analyzing just the visual aspects of movies and were able to predict success based on identifiable visual aspects of those movies. So you can see this in a variety of ways. Um, lower level. Toothbrush, right? You probably don't think of AI and toothbrushes. Well, 
Oral-B came out with their genius toothbrush, uh, which uh, is actually using artificial intelligence to figure out uh, whether or not you will properly brush your teeth and where you need to brush more. And of course, because competitive, there's a great deal of competition in the consumer products world, uh, Colgate had to come up with their version of it. Um, and by the way, I'm going to talk about video too, but video is just a lot of images that move fast. Right? This is not new. This goes back to the invention of filmmaking over 100 years ago. Uh, you know, you have, what, 30 frames a second, or it could be more, uh, but it's basically frames mean individual still images. So all the tools I just mentioned to you are available as well for video. Um, this is an example. This is a, a small company, I guess it's based in Paris and in New York, um, that can take real-time visual data and instantaneously classify it as all sorts of applications. Um, you have um, the, the ability, yes, I'm sorry, you have the ability um, to um, analyze um, job applicants. So there's a lot of interviewing now that's done via Zoom or other tools like that. Uh, and on the other on the other side, if you will, the employer side, you can now use AI to see whether or not the person really is excited about what they're talking about, honest about what they're talking about, and so forth. And then you get to the point of really being able to do even more by, by analyzing video uh, for your business purposes. And I, I, I'm going to play this, this video quickly. Realize is the world's leading platform for measuring how people feel as they view video content. When people watch video at home or on the move, we collect their subconscious emotional responses by simply sharing their webcam. Test any demographic, anywhere in the world, and get insights from all of those responses in one simple dashboard. You can see, second by second, exactly how your audience feels about your video content. So this is an example of the kind of thing we talk about in the use of AI uh, on video. Um, then you can have images that are generated by AI. Now we're getting to the generative AI that we have all seen in the last year or two. Um, you can actually, this has been going on more than the last year or two, by the way, uh, at least for the last several years, there's something called the generative adversarial network um, that can help transform images. Images You can go from zebras to horses, win winter to summer, or whatever you want to change. Uh, it's called adversarial because they're basically two different machine learning programs. One is trying to fool the other one. That's how you get your deep fake images. Um, Disney um, has used the neural networks and the same kind of approach to change an actor's age with ease, right? So you can have somebody in an age limb or make them younger. We've already seen this in a couple of movies over the last year. Um, you can take a still life and make it a movie, right? So here we have the Mona Lisa, and we can sort of set it up so she's actually talking. By the way, it's quite easy to uh, add her voice to this, and then we can find out truly what Da Vinci was like. Anyway, <clears throat> and and even this kind of thing in sales. So uh, Neiman Marcus, a uh, uh, big retail outfit in the United States, um, has used this um, um, smart mirrors that are, called, that are called smart mirrors. So the young lady on the left is wearing a red dress, but she's interested in what it might look like in green. They don't have that in the store, but they can certainly show her what she'll look like uh, wearing that. In the lower right, she doesn't even need to be wearing a dress. You can automatically place clothing on her so she can see what the options are. This tremendously expands what they can do, by the way. It enables them to compete with online services because now they don't need to have all that stock physically in inventory to still be able to provide their customers with an idea of how they might look in a new piece of clothing. Um, there's even this kind of thing. I'm not quite sure how I feel about it, but this was a, a company that can transform voice. We're not talking just about images now. Uh, you can transform voice. Uh, what they're doing is taking out the accents that people have in foreign call centers. So if somebody is calling a help desk in Europe or the United States and it's actually being answered in India, they will take out the the accented sound and make it sound like it's a local person. Again, transforming the voice in the same way you can transform pictures. And then you get to DALI 2, uh, where you can generate images from text. You just basically say something, create a picture for me, and there you have it. Then more recently is DALI 3, 
Um, and you can see in the lower right, hopefully that's visible to you, you can now even ask it to make partic describe particular aspects of the picture in different sections of the picture. You can even, you know, Mid Journey is another competitor of Dali. Um, you know, and I love that their catchphrase is a thousand words is worth a picture, uh, which is sort of, you know, an uh, opposite of what we've all been taught when we were younger. But basically, you know, you can have all sorts of realistic pictures coming out of them. This is an example of creating an image in the middle of New York City of something that does not exist. Um, stable diffusion, another one. And um, by the way, you can run stable diffusion on your laptop. Um, that's a point I'm going to make uh, a little bit later as well. Um, we have um, um, the, the Beacon Hill area in Boston, very traditional. They, there are no palm trees in Boston, but you can ask it to have them there. Um, people have been using this stuff to take their own pictures and create avatars for online conversations. Um, people have been doing this stuff in terms of websites, creating art. Um, you can generate product variations. So you, a customer can say, I like this shirt, but I'm interested in some variations. And automatically, you can generate those as well. Um, then the next big thing that's happening is text to video, right? So I just showed text to pictures. The next step, it's already happening, a little bit in the early stages, uh, but it's already happening as text to, to video. This is just, these are just some examples. Um, you can see this one is uh, that does sort of make a video, and you can see shoveling snow or a panda eating bamboo. That's all that was said, and the software is able to create these images that are reasonably realistic. And this is actually now from a year ago, so it's getting better. Um, and then you get into this thing. That's my point here. A combination of text, images, and video. Uh, this is a company uh, called Runway, um, and their latest version allows you to do any combination of these things in order to create video clips. By the way, there are other senses beyond vision. I've already mentioned a, a little bit uh, sound, but there's uh, you can go beyond that. You can create songs and music uh, and voices. Um, you can even, if I get this to go here, create things in the style of, whoops, oh well, we'll skip that. It was in the style of Katy Perry, uh, and you can create any songs you want to in the style of anyone. And then the sense of smell, bet you didn't think about that too much, you know, smell o vision they used to call this. Well, in, in Israel uh, over the last year, they created a robot that has a sense of smell that's as good as a dog's sense of smell which, by the way, as you know, quite good. Um, and of course, going from just the analysis to new products, you already have people who are trying to create new smells based on AI. Yeah, talk, Jack Niss. Jack Niss, yeah, Dr. Dr. Jack Niss. Jack Niss. I think it's a little gay that he shows some art than these big speak models. Uh, for det er jo det vi, det er jo det vi veldig mange av oss bruker hver dag for tiden. Men han viste jo masse andre eksempler utover det. Ja, ja. Det er nesten sånn. Vi sier, uh, altså du skal ha en, en, en hva heter det, en scotch, i stedet for å si en uh, tape, sånn, du, altså, sånn, så du ja. lim tape. Altså folk, du får, du får en branding, og det er nesten sånn. Vi er inne i en sånn chat gitt på det liksom bara blivit en ja AI i stället för AI så ser du chat GTP men uh, det är er morsamt och det är där många möjligheter nu visar han en del möjligheter och det är er ju morsamt den med med en tandbörste alltså när du kan börja och träcka hur du pussar tänderna dina ja. och få uh, optimalisera och du får med alla tänderna det är i spegel Eller var det tandbørsten? Nej, du får jo den på mobil så du får optimalisert, <laughs> ja. men de samler jo informasjon om deg. Men også dette speilet. Mm. Altså hvis du ser på, på online shopping. Ja. Hvis det, det den eksempelen som han brukte med det speilet, eh, hvis det blir et kommersielt tilgjengelig produkt, altså det er jo bare snakk om pris og volym, eh, og du kan ha det hjemme. Og hvis du da adder på kanskje en 3D-scanning av kroppen din, så du kan gå in i kanske en kiosk i Oslo eller i Bergen eller var du är er, och så 3D skannar du kroppen in får det in i appen ser på spegeln och du ska sitta hemma och pröva klär så kan du gå igenom Ja för nu är er det där nu är er det här för det detta har man ju snackat om i många år ja. alltså den här 
hologrammer och spegel ja, ja. och att man ska kunna pröva kläder online. Och så och så har det inte varit där, men då nå... nu har vi det för vi har computkraften både hemma och på på jobb. Men hvis du ser bedrifter, hur det kan disrupta en bedrift eh uh, du ser en klädbransch då alltså hur den visst vi visst visst jag kan släppa gå på butiken och handla kläder ja. men jag kan sitta hemma och browsa igenom och veta att det beställa passar till storleken min. Mm. Uh, jeg jag måste kanske skanna mig uh, var månaden sin går lite upp och ned. Ja. Uh, men uh, men det vill ju ha varit en en fantastisk ting för mig och säkert många som är er lik mig. Ja. Så så det finns det så och så har du den intervjuen snackat om. Ja, för det nog kommer lite in på uh, för dessa gutta är er ju amerikanere. Ja. De har ett annat syn på personvern än det vi har i Europa. Ja. Och det uh, tog jag Magnus upp uh, i chatten här också. Ja, i uh, fallet GDPR uh, ja. och säkerhet och då kommer ju AI akt nog in. Ja. Uh, fra EU och EUS där där vi må vite vad vi gör vi må vite vad vi gör för att det här är er Men vilka delar av det han snackat om tänker du um, vill vara problematisk i i EU eller med hänsyn till den EU-akten AI-akten Mycket det som är er risiko där är nog är en specialist i i EU-akten men det är er ju riskovärderingen mm. alltså det är er extremt viktigt att bedrifter gör en riskovärdering på vad de ska ha på AI på hur de går för det är högre i den definition. Jag har väl definierat det er fyra eller fem Fredrik klasser med risiko. Ja. Och du har oacceptabel risiko och så har du hög risiko sånt. Detta må bedrifta vite för du börjar för exempel att bruka AI till att intervjua folk. Ja. Eh, då ska ju folk få, få möjlighet eh, om de och de ska vite det. Eh, de ska få möjlighet att säga si nej tack. För det där er, detta är er ju verkligen ja. kommer in och Men det er jo bare å putte det inn i personvernerklæringen, og så får du en check på den, så bare alt i orden. <laughs> ja. ja, og dette er jo veldig spennende hvordan bedrifter vil gjøre det. Ja. Altså er det på side 29 i brukerbetingelsene? Ja, sant. Eh, så her er mye jobb som må gjøres, mye ja. jobb. Men det viktigste er jo at bedrifter ser på sikkerhetsprofil, på hva de skal bruke AI til, og at folk som skal gjøre det er trent, eh, helt klart. Det er eh, ekstremt viktig. Och så är er ju det også en del av snack om här det är er ju en flodbølge av open source verktyg som kommer nu. Ja. Det är er inte ting som IT-avdelningen normalt förhåller sig till. Nej för det är er mer förretnings. Ja för nu är er ju förretningsorienterat vi köper vi köper software med vilkorsavtal som är er allt ja. Här är er en flodbølge av verktyg som kommer och vi ska in och i nästa session med Dr. Jack Ness så ska han gå lite mer in på det. Men hur ska du hantera säkerhet i den världen där? När du med, med open source verktyg så du får massa open source verktyg, du får i stället för SQL non SQL eh, en helt annan måte att tänka IT drift på. Ja. Och hvis inte IT drift följer med på den utvecklingen så vill ju de falla av för det de, de, AI vill låst uppstå ett annat sted i bedriften utanför kontroll där datan ligger. Och det är er datan igen så jag har sagt flera gånger det är er ju datan som är er kilden till allt det vi ska göra på AI. Ja. Sant? Och idag är er ju datan kanske distribuerat över flera skyar, flera datacenter, flera avdelningskontor, flera land. Eh jätteutmaning och så har en säkerheten runt detta här eh för den för det på plats. Ja, alltså första gången man brukar eh uh, typ chat GPT då. Så skön man ju hur datorna kommer ifrån. Alltså vi känner det kommer ut från internet men vi känner inte hur hur det kommer ifrån. Eh uh, där har er det blivit förklarat att du kan ju också fora ehm uh, chat GPT med genom såna GPT GPTs eh uh, fora med den information du vill att vi ska bruka som grundlag för det de svarar på. Ja då. Och det är det ju mer exakt då. Ja. Jag tror jag också skrev lite om i ja. i chatten till dig. Men du, du kan ju snurra på en annan måte, mm. hvis vi ser på bedriftsmässigt. Visst inte du ivaretar säkerheten din. Kan jag inserta fake data in i din datavärlden? Ja. Och få dig till att ta fel beslutningar? Hur vet du att det är er dina data? Hur vet du att det är er riktigt? 
hela detta här är och egna nettaviser som som är bara AI <laughs> Ja ja. Så det är er ju mycket fake news där ute och med andra men du kan i bedriftssammanhang visst inte du i vara av säkerheten så kan du potentiellt och det är er det här med AI potentiellt kan vi in ge dig data utan att du vet om det. Mm. Och ta fel beslutningar. Alltså du tar fel beslutningar för vi har forat in. Det kan vara en konkurrent som putter in fel data in i ditt system så tar du fel beslutningar och så är er du ute. Ja. Så det att detta med säkerhet och kontroll på datan, vi nämner det hela tiden, men det är er, det är er så viktigt och det ser jag Gartner och alltså du måste kunna kontrollera datan inne och gärna tagga sånt som vi i Nutanix snackar om, alltså hur kan vi tagga datan dina eller hur kan vi säkra att datan du har är er riktig data som kommer. Ja. Och det det är er nog vi ikke har på plats ännu men vi ser på teknologier. Och jag tror det blev och nämnt eh, vanmärking av data. I ja. gamla dagar vet du. Så vanmärket vi brev ark ja. för att säkra det var kvalitet och sånt. Ja. Hur kan vi göra det med data? Och där finns det några spännande startup som eh, som ser på det. Ja. Så det det är er väldigt spännande. Men det, du var inom uh, detta här med fake news. Det som är er lite intressant med fake news är er ju också att det tar så mycket längre tid att demontera fake news än att lage fake news. Ja. Det syns ju russarna är er stort och morsamt. <laughs> ja. För de lager ju mycket eller prövar att påverka hur vi tänker och gör ja, ja. i i västliga uh, världen. Men det måste jag kunna gå och snu det på hodet och så brukar AI till att demontera för exempel Och det har brukat teknologi för att lösa ja. problemen till teknologin. Men du vet när någon har läst en nyhet och de tror på den. Unread. Unread. <laughs> Vi har inte teknologi för att unread brain till folk. Nej. Så det är er ju sånt. Men alltså fake news tror jag kommer från alla kanter. Inte bara Ryssland, men det, det kommer överallt. Ja. Uh, och det är er deep fake är er ju en 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 trussel så vi sticker vi finna måter och och göra det på. Alltså det det kan genereras nyheter från ett sällskap där chefen i sällskapet står och säger ting. Mm. Så aktiekursen stuper. Ja. Eh, utan att och så kommer det ut men det har vi aldrig sagt och så går aktiekursen tillbaka igen men det vill ta en stund. Men vi så bara tänk på spekulationer av hur vi kan du kan försöka manipulera marknaden och sånt det att ha kontroll det är er en kärnutmaning med med AI och ha kontroll på ting. Du, nå, vi ska ha en ny nytt inlägg med Jack Nis. Ja. Um, Vad ska han snakka om då? Nu ska vi genom uh, vilken option du har. Ja. Så det det finns så enormt mycket där ute. Det finns så enormt mycket så du kan gå genom och du måste finna ut var du ska. Uh, av alla dessa här optioner som finns där ute alltså tusenvis av ting du kan få få bruka ut så måste du som din bedrift mm. så måste du veta vilken ting du ska jobba med. Och det är er otroligt viktigt att få till. och ja. uh, så vill du som uh, IT-chef eller CIO uh, du kommer att bli överraskad. Du du kommer till att bli svampt med ting uh, för det är er så enorma möjligheter och sånt. Så hvis ikke du sällskapet får på plats en en typ av organisation, en AI projektmanager eller en måte att driva detta på, så är er det fort kommer ut av kontroll. Det är er väldigt fort gjort och det för det är er så enormt mycket du kan göra med AI. Det finns så enormt många optioner ut i det du kan bruka det till. vi vill gå igenom många exempel nu, men du måste bygga en, en ett AI team för att dessa AI-projekten drivs på en annan måte än traditionella projekt. Det är er många andra folk. De må fokusera på att fixa datan i för exempel. Hur lång tid tar det att fixa datan dina? Så en del av det ska vi snakka med höra Jack snakka om nu. Ja. Jack Nis. Då sätter vi över till Jack Nis igen. Varsågod. Okay, let's talk now about human natural language. Sometimes called natural language processing. Really, let's talking about the way we speak to each other. So even before ChatGPT, which I'm sure everybody's heard of, uh, natural language was used in business. Uh, you may not be uh, aware of it, uh, but for example, uh, J.P. Morgan Chase, big bank in the U.S., uh, did a test in which they found out that artificial intelligence did a better job in writing direct marketing sales pitches than their humans did. 
So they replaced them. Um, I love this article from the New York, uh, from the Wall Street Journal. Did a robot help create that ad? The answer increasingly is yes. Um, I think that that now, though, it has stepped up and gotten even much better and because we have these things called GPT, Generative Pre-Trained Transformers. I'm going to keep it real simple. All a transformer is, in a sense, is looking at the words around it. So it's running more context than traditionally was done. Uh, it pays attention to the word you're looking at and its relationship to other words. You may wonder why somebody wants to do this. Well, the idea was, I want, you know, on your phone, you, when you're typing in something, and oftentimes the smartphone will help you identify the next word so you don't have to type the whole thing. When they started doing this a couple of years ago, all they wanted to do was to try to predict what that next word would be. And that's how this got developed. And lo and behold, they found that when they were able to do that, it could do other things. It could answer questions. It could summarize things. It could even converse um, he could even write new content. And here we are now in the world of GPT with chat GPT, among others. Uh, there's chat GPT, there's Google Bard. Those are not your only choices. Um, I've listed some of them here. To the earlier point about cost, there's even a version that you can run on a USB stick that you can put into your, uh, you know, into your laptop or, or uh, desktop. Um, there are many options that can even run on your computers. I have listed, you know, I've listed a lot of them here. Um, there are more being developed every single day. And so more, more interesting kinds of twists. So one of the things that's happened over the last several months is there's a French company called Mistral uh, that has been able to uh, upset some of the traditional players in the generative AI world just because it had a different approach to things. Um, and then you've had specialized versions that are being developed. Um, a few months ago, Bloomberg, the, the big financial information company, uh, um, offered a, a Bloomberg GPT, which was, again, a, uh, one of these li large language models. That's sort of what's been built. That's the pre-trained part of GPT. Uh, they've had a specialized model of the language of finance. Uh, there's another one that was developed for taxes. They're being developed every single day. It's even hard to keep up with it, and I keep up with this obviously more than you do, but there's just so much going on. Um, GPT and its, I'll call its cousins, like Bard and others, are built on this idea of a large language models. And, and basically, what it's doing, it, in a sense, this goes back to an idea that's been in artificial intelligence for a while. Is there some way to transfer learning that was done by some other piece of artificial intelligence so I don't have to do it again, so I don't have to reinvent the wheel. Uh, the large language models basically were built by sucking up everything on the internet and analyzing and see how us human beings talk um, and then sort of organizing it in a way that made some sense. Uh, and that's what it's using behind the scenes in order to be able to converse with you uh, in chat GPT. Um, so this is, you know, you know, this has been a big part of it. Initially, when this was done, you needed to have a huge amount of resources, the kind of resources uh, that a Google or a, uh, or OpenAI supported by a Microsoft had, um, and uh, because it was doing so much analysis. Um, in fact, um, um, they learned, by the way, that this wasn't perfect. Um, so uh, they allow you now, as a human being, to provide some feedback as to whether or not the sort of response you're getting from these kind of software uh, is good or not. If you look carefully, if you use ChatGPT, um, you can see that this makes sense to you. Uh, Google's Bard actually will offer you three different versions of an answer to your question and ask you to choose which is best. They then take that human feedback um, and update their models. Um, by the way, bigger is not always better, and, and this is sort of, uh, again, to the point I'm going to raise a little bit later. Um, you know, what, what, what people have found is uh, there's, a certain, there's a certain amount of huge data that's no longer necessary in order to build these large language models. So the numbers are getting smaller as opposed to having to make them bigger. It may be true that you could get an extra half a percent uh, of performance out of an even larger language model but it's not worth the cost and the other downsides, which I will talk about momentarily. Um, CIOs, by the way, be open to surprises. This is a theme from Dr. Langer. Um, I love this. This is from an article uh, in, in uh, February of last year. Um, Chat GPT, all along the stuff that we thought would be hard, hard turned out to be easy. As you asked people in data science and artificial intelligence a few years ago, whether or not what we're doing now with chat gpt would be possible they said sure in the year 2030 maybe 2035 <clears throat> it turned out 
It wasn't as difficult as they thought. And a lot of what happens in AI, and this is why you ought to be prepared for surprises, is people are trying to solve one problem and they realize it opens up the opportunity to solve a whole bunch of other problems. So you're trying to predict what the next word ought to be. And in fact, you now have a whole variety of ways in which you can communicate with people and organize all the information on the internet. So what can you do with, with GPT? Uh, obviously, you know, if you're in colleges, and I think most of you probably aren't, but, you know, your children maybe, um, they they already are using this. Uh, this was just one example, you know, where a student had this kind of obscure essay to write. The chat GPT wrote it and got an A- minus in the course. There you go. Um, in fact, I love this little cartoon. Um, the robot saying, how am I supposed to start a robot apocalypse when you keep making me write term papers and essays? Um, and by the way, it's not just a question of being able to generate sort of text in a normal way, but even creativity. So what they found is that chatbots already surpassed the average human in creativity. There's an important point here about a lot of what I'm showing you, that the uh, AI is already at the level of the average human being. If you are a fantastic writer, a great novelist, a great musical composer, you don't need to worry quite yet. But if you're in this below, when you're in the, the, the lower half of that distribution of skills, then yes, you do need to worry that AI is going to do a better job than you. Um, you can even have full length. This is a, an example of created by chat, by GPT-4, which is sort of the next generation after chat GPT. Uh, it's generating a, a full length work of fiction. And then, of course, the computer also generated an audiobook out of it. Chapter one. A Cryptic Discovery The British Museum buzzed with activity as tourists and researchers I'm, I'm gonna, alike. I'm not going to read the whole thing to you, but you can Chapter get an one. idea. It's not it's a great novel, I don't know, but it's certainly it's as good as the average novel. Um, um, the uh, AB InBev, the, the huge um, global beer conglomerate, um, even launched an AI beer they named Bex Autonomous. Uh, in which they use both AI to generate the formula as well as the marketing campaign. Um, and, and then you get situations like this. Um, you know, ChatGPT ended up providing better customer service than the staff of this particular uh, Indian company. Um, so he fired the staff. Hmm. There are practical uses of GPT for decision making. Uh, you can see some things that allow you to help weigh different aspects of decisions. Uh, or even uh, help uh, identify particular markets for strategic planning. Um, here is this is from a, from an article. How to use ChatGPT if you're an innovator. Twenty use cases. You can see initially a number of them uh, have to do with strategy using ChatGPT and the kind of things that you typically would do when you go through a strategic planning process. But by the way, we're talking about languages here, but programming languages are also languages. In fact, they're much easier languages than most human languages. Um, and so, naturally, people have been using these same capabilities. Uh, you've got uh, ChatGPT as a debugging companion. Uh, Google's Bard can explain your code to you or somebody else's code. Um, you've got GitHub Copilot, which accepts code in real time. And you can see here, and you know, this I love this phrase, AI pair programming. Um, you know, I don't know how many programmers you have working for you, either directly or indirectly. Uh, they're under a lot of pressure to deliver their software without bugs and fast. Um, the surveys that I've seen is even though they're not telling their bosses they're doing this, roughly two-thirds of programmers are already using these tools to help generate the code that you're asking them to generate. Um, and even for the old stuff, um, you know, IBM uh, obviously has a lot of mainframes out there. There's still a lot of COBOL out there. Um, and so they're using these same capabilities to modernize COBOL applications. Then, of course, now, so you can do this stuff, you can see how they can generate it. So now they can actually have conversations with people. So you can, you know, the computer can now talk to people. You even get things like this. This was approved by the United States um, Food and Drug Administration that approves medical devices. Uh, this allows for conversational AI therapy, and it is certified as a valid medical device. Uh, you have this kind of thing uh, from this um, uh, website uh, where they've taken everything that individuals, famous individuals have said, um, so they can create virtual versions of those people. <clears throat> this is an example of asking Joe Biden uh, what he, uh, at the time, 
um, thought about um, uh, the middle, I guess about Mexico, and basically taking it, words he didn't necessarily say exactly, but based on sort of what he would have said. Um, you've got automated you know, software, you've got software from AI for accurate translation into all sorts of languages. Um, and then you get this kind of thing where you can actually com to combine the various things I've been talking about, both images, video, and text, um, and you can create your own avatar. This is just one example, but I thought it might be interesting. It's fairly short. You can easily create your own conversational AI human. Select your preferred model and style. Select your conversational chatbot, pick a background, and voila. Now that you've created your own AI human, you can use it for anything you want. So this is an example of the kind of thing you're beginning to see more of. Um, you can tailor GPT to your enterprise. Now, this is an important thing that you need to understand. Um, one of the problems that has happened uh, for, for stopping some enterprises from using some of these capabilities is that ChatGPT, as an example, is based on the public internet, and you don't want to share your proprietary corporate data. So you're beginning to see people responding to the need to have those same capabilities, but internally uh, and using your own internal proprietary data. So you can certainly incorporate GPT into your own apps, uh, and these companies are making this available to you. Um, you can even set up what sometimes called auto GPT or AI agents. So it's going beyond just creating the text. It actually can do ta tasks for you in some sequence and talk to people as needed. I love the name of the uh, one on the right um, in, in their version of doing this. They call it God mode. Um, you can go beyond documents from the Internet and incorporate internal documents. This is very important. Um, and this has really uh, uh, been picking up a lot over the last several months. Uh, Langchain is one of the better known ways of doing this. Um, and now you can actually maintain the secrecy of your internal documents, but still have the kind of benefits of the conversational aspects of uh, GPT that you've seen from the public internet. So that's a lot of the technology. But obviously, you're in a position where you need to think as well about how to implement all this. And I'm going to fairly quickly go through this, but I think there's some important issues for you to understand. Uh, first of all, let's just talk about hardware. Machine learning has been primarily in the cloud. Um, the, the reason for that is it's obviously been a concern in IT shops about the burden on normal systems. Uh, most of the things I've talked about, at least in the stage when you're developing models, or you know, building large language models, things like that, they are computationally intensive. They use up a lot of resources, and if you're running regular production systems, you don't want to share those resources. Um, in addition, a um, the, the lot of the cloud providers have made it really easy. They've made all, all sorts of capabilities, uh, algorithms available uh, in the cloud already, so that you don't need to actually write any of these your, yourself. By the way, on the other side of this, not just the cloud, is AI at the edge. And there's been this whole movement of tiny ML or edge AI, whatever you want to call it, um, that is just absolutely amazing because that same increase in computer power now allows you to run artificial intelligence operations on a fairly small device. Um, I just got a, a, a drone, for example, that has AI built into a, a little thing, not very big, that weighs less than 250 grams. Um, that can do everything from recognize people and follow them uh, to even change the color of the sky or maintain uh, stability in a windy storm. Then there's the software side. Um, and, you know, you don't need to do all this by yourself. Um, there have been a variety of ways that this has been available and over the last several years, at least. Keras has been well known as a library that you can use so you don't need to write a lot of these algorithms yourself. Uh, there's a machine learning exchange. Uh, there are even specialized tools, uh, for example, for images and computer vision. Um, um, Andrew Ng, who is uh, one of the world's best-known AI experts, has set up this company that allows you, as he says, computer vision made super easy. You just upload the pictures. It has It's doing all the work in the background. Uh, you've got a whole bunch of other things. There's open um, CV face recognition, uh, Google has their automated ML uh, for vision. So just an example of specialized tools uh, that are out there. So, you know, you don't actually need to get a whole bunch of software to do it. Um, there are no code tools. So you've got companies like Teachable Machine, um, even, uh, um, believe it or not, Uber has uh, an AI shop. 
uh, and they've made available their tools so that you don't have to write a lot of those. Uh, there are open source packages. Actually, Europe has been uh, the leader in this. Uh, there's a package called NIME, K-N-I-M-E. I guess they're based in Switzerland. Um, uh, Orange Data Mining, I think they come from a university in Slovenia. This is an example of what their interface looks like. Uh, you don't see Python code. What you see are different uh, modules um, or functions uh, that are put together in a workflow to be able to do the kind of things I've been talking about. Um, and of course, you can use AI to build AI. Right? This is not the least bit surprising. Let's talk about AI project management. Uh, how do you do this? So I, this is part of a, a video from the Chief Technology Officer of Hewlett Packard Enterprises. Uh, what I love about it is he's comparing over his 30-year career the difference between traditional software and the way that we look at things now. Um, and, and frankly, what he's pointing out is we, uh, we used to build rules from the top down. Even when they used to have things called expert systems, it was based on a top-down approach. And, and the difference in philosophy with AI today, as opposed to AI 20, 30 years ago, is we're just building it all on data. We're, he's, he's, as he puts it here, we're taking examples or observations and asking the computer to build the rules from what it observes and the patterns it finds in it. So you need to sort of understand the different nature of the kind of software that's going to happen, and that means there's a different way that AI projects will occur compared to regular IT projects. I think that, um, you need to allow time to build your expertise about the domain, whatever the, you know, is happening. It's not, you're not, your job as a technology leader is no longer to worry about how to push bits through some wire over the air, but understanding what the content means for your enterprise, what those bytes mean for your enterprise. Um, you have to be able to be realistic and limit the scope of what you're promising initially and be aware this is a learning curve. I always say, you know, people talk about machine learning. The biggest part of a successful AI projects is human learning. Um, and that you need to bear in mind and need to account for times for all sorts of other issues. Um, uh, Dr. Langer, you know, talked about the, the increasing risk factor. I'll sort of emphasize it here. This is the difference in a lot of ways, um, despite all the various challenges we've had with traditional software, <coughs> traditional IT projects, or a little bit like using a map and saying, I want to drive from Paris to Vienna. Um, you know, here are the various options. And, you know, I can do that. I can lay it out. I know what the territory is like. With AI, you don't know what the territory is like. It's more of an exploration. Um, and so this may be like the first time you're exploring on Antarctica or something like that. It's a very different kind of thing. You need to be open for the fact that there can be all kinds of risks. Um, and you may end up actually finding at the end of that long trip that you really don't want to be there. Anyway, um, it's really hard to tell in advance what's hard and what's easy. Um, and it's prone to fail in unexpected ways. Um, you know, there are some ways, and, and I'm not going to read all this to you. You'll see this in the slides. Uh, Andrew Ng has this uh, uh, a wonderful list of some ways uh, AI might surprise customers familiar with traditional software. Um, and I think getting again to the point about the, the risks in this new world in which we have such powerful software, but which also have risks, we don't know how accurate the system will be in advance. Uh, we really, you know, there are a lot of things we don't know because, again, it's an exploration. It's not a question of engineering in a well-known world. Um, by the way, I would suggest with you that maybe you start with IT. Uh, this is an interesting little book um, written by um, one of the leaders at Microsoft, who they talked about the transition of Microsoft into an AI organization. And more or less what he said was, you know, we're trying to, we need to understand the domain. Well, we understand the IT domain. That's our job. So let's start with our own job. It's fairly unusual. I used, I used to be a CIO, CIO and I used to joke with my own staff, you know, we're very happy to go out and tell everybody else they need to change and they need to adopt these new systems. Oftentimes we're the last people to change our own jobs. Uh, well, he said, let's be the first people. And I think that's something you might want to consider because you can understand the results and you are both the user and the designer, uh, which is a good position to be in. Um, then, you know, I'm sure all of you are familiar with the uh, emphasis last several years uh, to have DevOps and to do a better job of integrating the various aspects of systems from design to production. Well, there's a parallel effort going on not as well developed, but a parallel effort going on um, in the machine learning world called machine learning ops. Um, there's also, not to confuse you too much, but this can be confusing, uh, something called AI ops, 
which actually has been primarily focused on the IT uh, services. Sorry, I don't admit these terms. Um, anyway, uh, but you can see there is the beginning of a demand for a more formal process of doing this kind of work. So that's something that you'll need to consider increasingly uh, if you're in charge of leading these AI initiatives. Then there's the question of creating the team for AI, right? Who are these people? What skills are needed? I think it's very important for you to think about it this way. Too often when your people are building these teams, they say, oh, I need a data scientist, I need this, I need that. Um, think about the skills first. You may find that people have different combinations of these skills. Um, and so you might want to think about those skills first. You need people who can clean data, who know a little bit about the machine learning algorithms. You need people to understand the subject matter and so forth. I'm listing some of these here just to help you think in your own mind what the skills are first, and then you can figure out where the people are. Um, by the way, I think uh, this is an important aspect. If you thought about this, heard about this a few years ago, um, this is an interesting chart and, and it's come true. Now, McKenzie did this in, I guess, the year 2020. And they said, today, most of the AI stuff um, is happening with a large number of people who are in the middle. So you have people who have a business understanding and you have people you need for deployment, but we have a whole bunch of data scientists. We're doing model modeling and evaluation, all kinds of stuff you can see there. And they said that we predict with the tools that are available now and the increasing automation of machine learning itself, that we'll need fewer of those people in the middle. And in fact, their, their prediction has turned out to be very much the case. In, in, indeed, uh, the IEEE, the worldwide organization, one of the leading computer organizations around, uh, noted that the salaries of uh, experts uh, in AI machine learning uh, have dropped, uh, dropped um, from the, the high point a few years ago because we need fewer of them because we have better software that can do this stuff on its own. I, I'm always fascinated when I first started talking to people about this who were in AI. I said, what makes you think, you're, the, you know, you, you talk about how the various ways that AI is going to affect everybody else's job. What makes you think it's not going to affect your job? Well, in fact, it has. So I think you ought to be creative in creating your own team. Do you need to have all these capabilities all the time? No. Um, do, who is the team, by the way? Really think a little bit more creatively about what your ecosystem is and who's available in it. They don't necessarily excuse me, need to be people on your own staff. They could be elsewhere in the organization. They could be among your um, partners. Think about that. The other thing is, does everybody have to be fully skilled? I will tell you that on some levels, um, you do not need... Um, to have somebody who is deeply into uh, data science in order to have value. Uh, there's, a, as I said, there are a lot of these tools that are out there. Uh, you can give somebody a NIME software, for example, and they can be um, providing all sorts of useful insights uh, on AI that uh, doesn't require them to do anything more than go through maybe a, a week or two initially of uh, some basic training. Now, you know, they'll learn if something is really complicated, you need to get more experts. That doesn't mean you need to have uh, somebody whose expertise uh, is available all the time, but only needed 1% of the time. Key takeaways. I'm going to summarize this now, and we'll have more opportunity for questions. And, of course, Dr. Langer is going to have a wrap-up as well. Key takeaway number one, um, AI covers many methods, algorithms, and applications I will say and remind you, you probably have noticed this already in the examples I've given, the best applications combine different methods. Um, instead of thinking about algorithms, though, it's more useful to think about three categories of business issues. Internal problems, external opportunities for more sales and enhancement of your products and services for your customers. Um, and the most recent advances obviously have been in image and natural language processing, especially with generative AI, um, and that really has made it much more possible and feasible for you to think about what you can do to enhance your products and services. <coughs> Key takeaways number two. Generative AI is not just about pretty pictures and conversations. I know a lot of folks have fun with, with ChatGPT or Dolly, um, but it can do many tasks and it can use, and it can uh, include the use of your internal data um, and knowledge without sharing it publicly. Computer programs are languages too, so consider using these capabilities for programming. AI projects are different from regular traditional IT projects. 
Finally, start small. <clears throat> Even small uses of AI can provide great benefits. Um, I, um, you know, I, I talk about low hanging fruit, right? There's just, uh, you know, I'm amazed people are saying, well, how can I use Gen AI? And you really should think about that. But frankly, there's a whole range of things that can be done with the AI that was available two years ago uh, that you have not done yet uh, that would be in incredibly valuable for your organizations. So, you know, think about those as well. And finally, getting started does not cost a lot of money or take years. Some of the things I've talked to you about, you can do on laptops. A lot of it's open source, doesn't cost anything to get the actual software. Obviously, there's a learning curve, but then, you know, but nevertheless, um, there's a lot that you can do now that doesn't require owning a, a large bunch of data centers the way Google does. So, you know, but there's a learning curve. So you need to get started. Uh, because that's the important part of it. And and otherwise, you're going to always be behind. Uh, you, there's just, uh, you know, there's no way to describe it otherwise. Unless you get started, you have a problem. By the way, your competitors are in the same situation. And one of the things about the world of AI is because everybody is continuing to learn, um, if they start moving at 100 kilometers an hour, and then you start a year later at 100 kilometers an hour, and they continue at 100 kilometers an hour, you're still going to be behind. You, it's not easy to catch up in this world. So you got to get started. Um, I would say start if you've already started or continue rapidly if you have. There's just so much you can do. And by the way, uh, this really finally gives us the opportunity as technology leaders uh, to show widespread strategic value of what we're doing to the places where we work. With that, I thank you all for your attention. And I, I guess it's, uh, oh, do I have a moment, EJ, for this? Yes, sir. Take the time. So one of the fun things I like to talk about, and this is one way of driving some of this home, had you read articles or, or, or been on YouTube maybe five years ago, you would have seen all kinds of fun videos of robots that look so stupid and tripped and they couldn't do the obvious things. Um, and so maybe about a year or so ago, Boston Dynamics, which is one of the world's leaders in, in robotics, um, basically was trying to show the progress. And I just wanted to give you a sense of how fast the progress is in a visual way. So here we have. Yeah, there was a little dancing. Så vanligt så ser vi at uh, AI kan overgå <laughs> mennesker. <laughs> jeg, jeg, jeg er bedre av dans enn det, da. Ja, du gjør det? Ja. <laughs> vi får, får vise det til siste innslag med, <laughs> med Art Langer. Da. Det var en dansoppvisning, nei. Ja, vi får spare det til en... Jeg har gått på, på dansekurs med min kone. Ja, det har det. Men uh, det var ikke helt suksess. Ja, så. Nej, så ja, det måste höra mer om sen. <laughs> Men uh, vad tänker du om uh, Jack Nis sitt sista inlägg? Ja, det visar ju vad vad vi kan göra som möjligheter, vad vi kan göra med AI och vad som finns där ute. Men det det tänkte jag skulle fokusera på som är då min takeaway, alltså ja, det finns oändliga möjligheter. Ja. Men du måste ha en projekt, altså dette må styres, for dette, AI drives på en annen måte, altså som man, det drives fra bunn og oppover eh, i dette her. Du må begrense skåpet ditt, for det, det er så mange muligheter, du må nå begynne, du skal begynne raskt, du skal komme i gang raskt med dette, du skal få det til å skje, du skal få muligheter, du skal utforske det, og da må du begrense hva du skal se på. Ja. Du kan gå ta 100 ideer, men du kan ikke gjøre alle på en gang. Du må begrense skåpet ditt og være realistisk. Og så ser vi i alle bedrifter vi snakker med, vi snakker jo med hundrevis av bedrifter uh, i Nutanix, og datene, datene er destruert, de har ikke kontroll på datene, de vet ikke alt de har. Ja. Det er ikke alle som vet hvor alt er en gang, altså... De, de er usikre på vad som ligger i skyen og hva som ligger lokalt, eller ja. hva som ligger i en backup, eller i en repository, eller hvor det er. Så det er altså, du må kvalitetssikre dataen dine. For ellers er rubbish in, er rubbish out. Så enkelt er det. Så det har vi snakket om flere ganger i dag, og det er det som er klue her. Og så må du bygge AI-team. 
Och det är er, så du ska ju bygga en AML modeller eller applikationer. Ja. Och det är er sån jag nämnde du kan få en färdig inne box från Nutanix, det är er en ting men du kan också bygga det själv. Och så må du börja med data cleaning, altså du må rense data, du må ha det, du må ha machine learning folk inne, data science folk inne i 10 minuter kanske. Subject matter expert inne i 10 minuter, altså du må finna ut vad du trenger. Eh, trenger du SQL eller någon SQL administrator folk som kan det av det tekniska. Ja, ja alltså det er team som har byggts. Det är er en one man Nei. game. Alltså begränsa skopet, bygg det teamet som ska vara där. Så om du har ofta så har du ju någon som är er entusiastisk och har mycket idéer om det eh om mig. Ja, i alla bedrifter eller i alla fall många. Ja. Men som du ser du måste bygga en större grupp och ja. som också får ägarskap från ledelsen. Ja. Du kan inte sätta en Hej lov och gode geek. Ja. ja, du kan inte sätta en och så in på ett rum och säga si, ta finn ut detta med AI och så testa ut. För det då kommer EU akten in sånt, AI akten till sån som må må styras. Så ja. det är er, er mye mye ting att du ta ta hänsyn till. Så du måste lägga en plan. Det måste komma upp massa idéer, idémyldring vad vi kan göra. Sätta ner ett team. Start small ha kontroll på datan dina och börja utforsk. Det är er det som är er beskeden här egentligen. Alltså du måste börja. Ja. Och då begränsa vad du gör och kom igång. Det blir det med rådgivning runt att eller? Inte på AI sig själv. Nej. Det vi i Nutanix gör, vi bara har en alltså det är er en inbox. Du mm. kan bara få en färdig med alla applikationer du trenger, så du kan komma in och slå på strömmen så så ligger allt färdigt installerat allt klart så du har en 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 GTP in a box mm. så du kan bara starta för det vi ser att bedrift att det är er kritiskt att de kommer igång. Ja. Och så är er det också väldigt som igen blivit nämnt i chatten. Hvis du ska börja ett sted du kan inte börja i en public GTP med Nei. dine data för då lär du en public GTP dine data det är er obvious så du må du må ha kontroll på den du ska lära alltså den modell du ska lära måste du ha kontroll på allt kommer alltså hur du puttar in datan och hur det kommer ut ja. för det är er dine data. Hvis du går ut i en public version utan att veta vad som sker så har du bara lärt någon andra baserat på dine data. Ja. Sant. Så i tillfället måste du ha fake data så du kan testa hur det funkar men det är er inte du du är er tror att till att driva med det så väldigt viktigt start lite kom fort i gång ja. ha kontroll på datan dina det är er väl och möjligheterna är er, som vi har sett nu från Dr Jacknis enorma möjligheter enormt med open source det finns så mycket där ute så du kan utforska bra ska vi komma oss vidare till uh, ja til, uh, sista sista strecken in här ja. Uh, vi ska nå till Art Langer och så ska vi se på organisation. Ja. Yeah. gå tillbaka till organisation för det är er det viktiga här uh, i få utnyttja detta. Akkurat som digitalisering. Startar och sliter i organisation. Så vi får på den så <laughs> ja. kommer det aldrig att fungera. Och där ser du nog vet du för det det är så krävs det organisationsändring alltså mot vi tänker på. Mm. Er det en ändringsledelse eller är er bedriften in mottaglig för detta. Uh, er är du villig att ta riskon? Har du grejer och som som IT-ledare eller IT-direktör har du grejer och ta veck IT-språket och förmedla det upp till ledelsen vad det går på ja. utan att snacka IT-språk. Ja. Så att de är er villiga att ta riskon. Ta sätta igång dessa projekt för det där er så vi har nämnt tidigare det är er projekt som vi lyckas och projekt som vill fejlas och fundingen må vara anledes på projekten. Så ja, riskovillig kapital. De, ja, de må vara villiga att ta risk och testa ut ting. Ja. De må pröva att reinventa sig själv och de må se på att organisationen är er med på den här resan här för att folk kan bli skrämt och mister jag jobben min hvis vi börjar med AI. Ja men jag jobbar ju på support eller ja Jag är er i marketing som du är er en en driver som eh, dotter att länge ska komma in på eller salg som är er en driver. Mm. 
ska vi generera kunstig salsupport för AI så kanske jag mist mistar jag jobbet min altså, så det måste folk komma att bli rädd för så vi må få med och därför är det väldigt viktigt att organisationer er med på den resan du ska göra nu de som blir påverkade ja och då måste de förstå lite av det för att känna sig trygga då ja de måste inte känna sig truet de måste känna sig att detta är er en framtid som är er bra för dig och som vill berika deras jobb och selskapet ska vi då sätta över till Art Langer. Vi tar sista med Art Langer nu så Ja, då är er sista strecket ditt uh, Art Langer. Varsågod. Okej. Okay. So there's been some questions here about my organization and the culture and and more importantly what we want you to consider is what your role is and how perhaps you can reimagine yourself, redefine yourself. Uh, because one of the things that I, uh, uh, in the time that I spend with technology executives, those that have been more successful than others, they are able to step up and uh, uh, redefine themselves. And too many technology people that are doing well are waiting for someone to give them a particular job. And unfortunately, that may not be the way to go because they may not consider you for that. So uh, part of this presentation is to think about how you, being in my mind the most valuable player in this whole activity, can uh, redefine, reimagine yourself like some have done uh, and and be aggressive to say, uh, here's what I think I can be and do in, in this organization. So the first thing is, once again, let's step back. And if we were in person, I would do my Michael Jackson, but I I, I can't here. So what, let's step back and talk about what organizations are really all about. And and the first thing is, and I learned this in the years that I spent what, what is now PwC, in those days it was Coopers and Libram. It, uh, one of the things companies have is departments that drive the business, which is defined as engaged in the front line or direct revenue generating activities. And there are essentially traditionally two departments that do that, right? One is sales and the other is marketing. You know, sometimes they're together. Now, everybody would agree then anybody who's in sales and marketing uh, doesn't get a hit every time, right? There's a failure rate. We take chances. We invest lots of money. We expect that not everything we're going to do. You don't go see a client and sell every one of those. Keep this in your mind because you're going to see where I'm going here. And everybody else in the organization is what we call a supporter, you know, like accounting, like uh, HR, like manufacturing and operations, right? And how do we judge those people? Uh, well, we kind of judge them as you can't take risks. You, you shouldn't have any failure rates, right? As, as much as possible. And we want you to do it as efficiently and cheaply as possible. All right? Like keeping the lights on. Keep that in mind. So the question becomes, is AI and information technology a driver or a supporter? All right. And in each of the examples I gave you, the, they are clearly one or the other. However, when we get to information technology and artificial intelligence, the answer to that question is not driver or supporter. The answer is yes. The answer is we're both depending on what we're doing. So AI is very unique and technology itself in that it is both a driver or supporter, but too many people are viewing it uh, as a supporter function for information technology people, right? Most of you would judge by, you know, how often you meet your budgets, how often you come in on time and on budget, all right? Yet we're beginning to see now that as we start this conversation before, that, 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 what the concerns are at an organizations, right, is how can technology and AI put us out of business? Well, the best way is to be aggressive in the, the driver area. Now, most of you do wonderful in the support area, but most of you would probably tell me you don't have enough money, you don't have enough people, nobody understands what you're doing, right? And they don't appreciate you enough and they keep cutting your budgets. But that's life as a supporter. 
Now, the first thing I would say to you is that all AI initiatives should be a driver and then become supporters over time. You remember the S-curve? Remember what I said that when we start into a market? Well, when you start into a market, the definition of a market, right, is a buyer and seller come together. So let's just say that an AI driver is an activity that changes the relationship with your customers. It makes it easier or better. It increases your competitive availability. Remember that first slide that I showed you. However, so many of you are not looked at that way. And you need to, the better word I would say, you need to reinvent yourself in this world and make yourself relevant at board level conversations. And at the same time, you still got to keep the lights on. So some of your operations are in the early stages of the S-curve. Some of them are in the middle. And a lot of them, all right, are at the end. And what do you do with them? You outsource them, don't you? To make it as cheap as possible. And the answer is, which ones do you do? The answer is yes. You have to do all of them. You have the hardest job in the world. You're fighting a two-front war. One minute you're supporting and you're doing it as cheap as possible with no errors. And in the other area, which you're underachieving, many of you, you need to take risks. You need to talk about S-curves. You need to reinvent your role and show how you can change the culture. So AI can drive the business strategy and yet support it at the same time. Now, look at the way I'm talking to you right now. I'm not talking to you as a techie. We can have technology conversations. We can talk about compiler design and all those cool things. I'm talking to you as a business person. And that's how you have to articulate these issues. And if you do, it's a breath of fresh air. So how do you rebrand your role to include a, a forceful part of AI? Define both sides of it as I've just done, all right? And use a, an analysis of that and an analogy. And people like your CFO and your operating people and your CEOs and your boards will be able to comprehend it because right now they simply do not. Communicate regularly of the risks of generative AI. Show people that you're thinking about it, not from an IT perspective only, but from an organizational and a competitive. Most Effective technology leaders today are spending 80% of their time in the field and have able and capable people in the back end of, the, of their organizations handling the support parts of their roles. Instill confidence that you know the pros and cons. Not necessarily everything, but that you're on top of it. Don't wait for the woman to call you in and say you ought to outsource this. Or we should have a risk model for these various different things. Always relate your data strategy to business objectives. Avoid technical terms. And let me tell you something else. Avoid technical jargon. Talk like a business person. Your only asset, by the way, is the data. I'm sorry to tell you that. That is the only asset that technology has the way you're defining it now. You have that data. And if you can make that data useful, that's a very powerful part of the organization. And compare that data strategy with the peers and your top competitors. Are you behind your competitors? Are you in line with your competitors? Or are you ahead of them and should talk about that more and market that more? So just getting back to that, you know, I could be here for two days talking to you about how to do this. This is what we teach in our technology programs and our leadership but the opportunity could not be better. Could not be better. Tack, uh, Art Langer. Ja. Ja, hva tenker du om den siste? Den siste? Jeg siste synes det er en, en, en god, god oppsummering der. Ja. Eh, det at eh, folk forstår at AI-toget er i begynnelsen av S-kurven. Det, ja. er, eh, det, det er nå det er mulig også komme i gang, gjøre ting, uh, få ting til å skje. Og der kan jo vi nu Nutanix hjelpe til. Yeah. Uh, og dere already on har jo spisskompetanse også innenfor dette. Vi har jo folk som jobber med, med AI, så det er bare yeah. å, å, å spørre om det også yeah. område. Vi hjelper gjerne til å peke i riktig retning med hvilke produkter eller yeah. hva som kan 
gjøres. Ja, og dere har jo veldig god spesielt innenfor HR, så er jo dere har en unik løsning. Ja. Så egentlig så det er bare å komme i gang. Det er bare å så vite at det kommer masse, 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 masse mer på denne fronten her. Hver dag kommer det nye ting ut her. Igjen til det kjedsomlige, data. Du må ha kontroll på dataen dine og få de til å vite det er der det som avgjør om du kommer til å lykkes med AI eller ikke, det er dataen dine og sist jeg vil si sånn EU AI Act følg med på det forstå, ja følg med på det men selskapets risikotoleranse innenfor dette med AI det er veldig viktig at du som selskap definerer din risikotoleranse i henhold til de som en lag du drar meg litt i to retninger nå du sier kom i gang med AI og så samtidig så sier du men vær forsiktig med ja, for hvis du skal adresse det er jo ikke innført enda nei, men det kommer hvis du setter i gang med AI nå så er ikke det noe som kommer ut i morgen du skal gjennom prosesser og innen 2026 når dette ser ut til å være tre i kraft så hvis du har gjort all jobben din og ikke har satt riktig risikotoleranse på det du skal gjøre, så kan det være bortkastet. Du må ha bevisst forhold til det i forhold til både utvikling og innkjøp av AI. Jeg tror dette kommer av seg selv akkurat som med personvern, for etter 2018 som personvern har kommet, så ser du at folk har fått de har fått mye større grad eget sånn personvernombud. Folk som har har ansvar for det. Så når jeg snakker med kunder der ute, og så sier jeg, ja, men det kan vi ikke gjøre på grunn av personvern. Så sier de veldig ofte, ja, men det skal jeg ta opp med da, personvern ansvarlig hos oss. Og det vil jo si at denne kulturen har kommet. Kulturen er, ja, har kommet. Og det tror jeg kommer til å skje med AI også, selv om AI kommer kanskje kan være i hvert fall på dette stedet være litt mer ult å forstå. Det er litt mer ult, og det vil jo gjelde også hvis du skal kjøpe en tjeneste, AI-tjeneste. Så det er fortsatt din bedrift som kjøper en amerikansk AI-tjeneste som da ikke er underlagt EU, men du skal være i EU eller EØS som vi er, så vil det fortsatt være du som er ansvarlig. Men også de store cloudene, type AWS og Azure, de er jo også i Europa, og det vil vi jo helt sikkert se med AI-tjenesten også etter hvert. De går jo antagelig på de cloudene, så det er jo egentlig bare å flytte seg. Så, veldig viktig risikostyring. Og så, andre som vi vil avslutte med, det er å sørge for at de ansatte som jobber med AI har nødvendig opplæring i virksomheten sine retningslinjer og regulative krav. Mhm. For det er de som bygger dette, det er de som henter inn og prosesserer og gjør ting. De må vite når de er innenfor, sånn at de ikke går utenfor. For jeg vil tro at ledelsen kan til tider ha vanskelig å forstå akkurat det, for de har ikke oversikt på hvilken data som er hentet inn. Det er ikke sikkert at de er nede i de detaljene. At det er et kamera som står og overvåker et eller annet, og så tar du inn og så, oh shit, det er det. Der vi skal være. Så det er det siste. Det aller siste, før vi sier takk for nå, det er at du skal annonsere noe spennende som skjer i Barcelona. Ja. Som er .next. .next heter det. Det er vår brukerkonferanse. Vi har jo masse, masse, masse brukere rundt om i Europa og hele verden for så vidt. Og i oktober så har vi vår brukerkonferanse som er et kjempemulighet for selskapet å forstå hvordan du kan håndtere data, hvordan du kan sikre data, hvordan du kan komme i gang med AI og få ting til å skje. Så det er i mai. Anbefaler virkelig at noe sted kommer dit. Barcelona i mai høres ikke. Barcelona i mai er jo ting. Og vi kjører en kampanje, så du kan få, siden du har vært med her i dag, så kan du få 25 prosent tilbud 25% billigere rabatt heter det, promo hvis du ønsker å delta rabatt er noe man får, ikke noe man gir så da kan du få en kickstart på 
data, datasikkerhet, kom i gang med GTP in box, liksom få en kickstart på det som vi snakker om i en multi-hybrid skyverden. Veldig bra. Da tror jeg vi får avslutte her, og da vil jeg avslutningsvis si tusen takk til alle dere som har fulgt med på denne masterklassen. Tusen takk til alle dere som har kommet med bidrag i chatten. chatten ja. Ja, for jeg gir en, en ny eller en ekstra dimension. Ja. Um, og så tusen takk til, til dig fra Nutanix. Nutanix, ja. Og undertegnede. Ja. Og så er jeg også nevne at uh, selve arrangementet er kjørt på AO-plattform, som er en læringsplattform som vi bruker, der vi kjører streaming genom Vimeo. Ja. Klar. Så sier jeg tusen takk til alle sammen.